Oh, how many of you read the wrong chapter? <laughs> Joanne's like, we're on chapter four. No, we're on chapter three. <laughs> we did that last year too. Actually, David taught the same exact chapter that I taught the week before. <laughs> hey, come on up. It's your turn. <laughs> That's okay with me. I don't mind that at all. Yeah, it probably, it probably did. How's everybody enjoying this so far? You getting a lot out of it? That's good. Because tonight we're going to go into the deep end of the pool. Y'all ready? I think it's important to always, always, always remind you that if this steps on your toes, you need to, you need to process it and look at it that it's good. It's teaching you something new. Um, not a lot of us came from understanding what boundaries were. Uh, I know me personally, I had no idea. Um, it's kind of like people that, it, it would be like you and I walking outside and there being a jet out there and us climbing in and thinking that we can drive it. We do that in our lives. Uh, no, we have no instructions, no anything. And a lot of us have, have been raised to where we think that we know how to drive that jet, but we've gotten in that jet and uh, crashed several times, right? So the boundaries is the exact same way. It's almost like learning a new language. I know the first couple times I went through boundaries, honestly, it for me, it was like learning a new language because I was boundaryless. All of the problems that we're going to talk about tonight, I will readily tell you all that I, you can combine them all, and that was me. Every one of these, as, as I've gone through these, like, yep, 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 yep. Now, areas that definitely God has strengthened me in, um, and then areas that I still need work in. I will tell you that I appreciate all of you that reached out to me after the first time and said that you were that first lady. I so appreciated that because that's how I was when I first read this. And it means that you're identifying and you're not, you're not taking any condemnation whatsoever out of this, but that we're growing. So tonight we're going to talk about boundary problems. So boundary conflicts are not limited to those who can't say no. It can also be when you don't respect other people's limits. So these are these both areas are boundary problems. Um, here we go. We're going to start with the first one. We'll jump right in. The first one, number one, are compliance. And compliant people say yes to the bad. And Dr. Cloud talks about Robert. And Robert came to Dr. Cloud, and Dr. Cloud immediately started doing some root work. Robert was trying to understand why he had so much difficulty refusing his wife's constant demands. He was going broke. How many of you have heard of the statement, keeping up with the Joneses? Everybody heard of that statement? And I'm sure all of us in here have done that in times of our lives, but he was literally going broke and he could not tell his wife no. The neighbor would get something, she had to have something like it, and, and on and on and on. He could not tell her no. Um, as he started doing some of the root work, he, discovered, he uh, began to tell Dr. Cloud that he was the only boy in his family and he was the youngest of four. Uh, there was a double standard, though, in his home involving physical fighting. Now, I think a lot of you guys, you in here are going to relate to this. His older sisters were allowed to wail all over him, and he was told that boys don't hit girls. How many of you can relate to that or came from that, that type of a system? Okay, so uh, Dr. Henry Cloud hears this, and he determines that he is completely filled with shame. He had literally just uncovered part of his problem and part of his conflict with his wife. So when parents teach their kids, their children, that setting boundaries is bad, don't do that. Don't set a boundary. It's bad. They are training them that others can do with them as they wish. And then, of course, they send them, their children, out into an evil world completely defenseless because boundaries are bad. 
And when a child internalizes that boundaries are bad, they think they are bad. They are bad when they have to say no or when they want to say no. So then they end up just saying yes to all the wrong things. Children need to be able to say no. Children need to be able to say, I disagree. They need to be able to say, I will not. They need to be able to say, I choose not to or stop that. It hurts. It's wrong. That's bad. I don't like it when you touch me there. Children need to be able to say that. They need to be able to own that and say, no, it's not okay. Blocking a child's ability to say no will handicap a child for life or obviously until they learn boundaries, which was the case with, him, with Robert. So Robert's boundary injury caused him to say yes to bad things. And thus, it paralyzed his ability to say no. And this is the definition of compliance. Uh, compliance, their boundaries melt in the demands and the needs of others. They cannot stand alone, distinct from people. Can't stand on their own. So an example is, hey, how would you like to go to Jerry's? And let's say a compliant hates Jerry's and hates Jerry's food. A compliance, you ain't going to hear that. Sure, let's go to Jerry's. And then the next time, hey, you want to go to Jerry's? Sure, let's go to Jerry's. And the next time, hey, you want to go to Jerry's? Sure, let's go to Jerry's. How about this one? Hey, Jason, let's go to a, a romance movie. Sure, babe, let's go to a romance movie. Hey, babe, let's go to a romance movie. Sure, let's go to a romance movie. They don't have the ability to say, you know what? This time, let's go to a romance movie because you like that. And next time, let's go to a drama. That's what good boundaries look like. But a compliant will never do that. They'll just comply. They'll just go along with the flow. So they don't cause any waves. They don't want to cause any waves whatsoever. So what they do is they minimize their differences to not rock the boat. Anybody understand this? Not only does this keep us from refusing evil in our lives, but it often keeps us from even recognizing evil. Everyone get that? Not only, it, it not only does this keep us from refusing evil, so we won't refuse evil, but oftentimes we don't even recognize it. When we're a compliant, we don't even recognize evil. Because we'll just go along with the flow. Um, think about, uh, the first, let's say a child was raised to where they, they the, it, being a compliant, and the first time that they are offered weed. Well, I'm just going to go along with the flow. My friends are doing it. I might as well do it. You see how important boundaries are, especially as they get older? It's important that you allow your kids to say no. Many realize this way too late, and by this time, when they realize it, they realize that they are in a controlling, abusive relationship. So let's talk about some of these reasons. So the type of boundary problem, uh, meaning they're paralyzed, the people's no muscle is paralyzed. It happens for a number of reasons. So let's go over some of them. Here we go. How about this one? The fear of hurting other people's feelings. I can't hurt their feelings, so I will say yes, even if it's something that I believe is not not what I want to do or not where I should go. I'll just say yes. How about this example? Um, I want to go, let's go fishing on Sunday. But we have church. Well, that's okay. Church is not a big deal. Come on, let's go fishing. A compliant will be like, okay, let's go fishing. Instead of saying, well, let's talk about this because we could go fishing, but why don't we make it, why don't we make it a, a priority and let's go to church first and then as soon as church is out, we'll go fishing. Okay, cool. Well, Compliant doesn't want to hurt their feelings. So I can't possibly hurt their feelings. Or how about this? How about you're stressed out and, and you have a ton on your plate and someone asks you to do something that is going to really push you over the edge to the point where you're having anxiety and, and, and a headache and losing sleep. A compliant will just roll with it and say, well, I'll just do whatever you need me to do. Whereas someone with good boundaries is going to prioritize and say, no, I can't do that even at the risk of hurting another person's feelings. 
And I know none of us want to hurt anyone's feelings, right? Okay, next one. Fear of abandonment and separateness. What about if I say no and they walk out on me? What about if I say no and they withdraw to the other room and go and pout? What if I say no and, and then I end up, I'm all alone. You see the boundary problems here? You see the, the problem in this thinking? How about this one? A wish to be totally dependent on another. We call this in the recovery world codependent. I got to be dependent on them, so I always have to say yes to them, even if it's something that's not good. The next one, fear of someone else's anger. Well, if I were to say no, they're going to explode on me. So therefore, I'm just going to go along with whatever they tell me to do. This is why compliance end up in controlling manipulative relationships, by the way. Uh, the next one is fear of being shamed. What's wrong with you? Can't you help out? Aren't you a good Christian person? How many of you have heard that one before? Fear of being seen as bad or selfish. You know, you're just selfish that you won't give me your time. You're just selfish that you can't give me a ride. I cannot tell you how many times my oldest son, Josiah, he had no boundaries because mom raised him with no boundaries. I can't tell you how many times he said to me, you're so selfish that you won't drive me to the gym. <laughs> Never mind that he had spent all of his money on frivolous things, and so he didn't have gas money for his car or didn't go to the gas station and ran out of gas. It was nothing to do with that. It was mom's responsibility, and she was selfish when she would say no. Next one is fear of being unspiritual. None of us want to be seen to anybody else as unspiritual, do we? People will use that on you, though. You need to say yes to me or you're not spiritual. Uh, next one, fear of one's over-strict, critical conscience. And, of course, we experience this as guilt and we condemn ourselves for the things that God doesn't condemn us for. But that critical conscience inside of us says, what's wrong with you? Can't you do, why can't you just comply? Why can't you just go along with the flow? This is the conscience that Pastor David has been talking about. Don't go along with the flow if your conscience says something different. If your conscience knows that you need to stay within these bounds, listen to that. Don't listen to the critical voice of shame and guilt and why can't you do more and, and what's wrong with you. Don't listen to those messages. In 1 Corinthians 8, 7, it says, Since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. You do realize that we can go against our conscience over and over and over and over and go. We can override it, override it. I'm not listening to that. I'll be a compliant. I'll just go along with the flow. I'll go, and we can do it over and over and over, and it gets really, really weak. And before long, we're not listening to it at all. All we're listening to is that critical spirit on the inside of us say, just don't make waves. Just, just go with the flow. At what cost? At what cost? The fear of disobeying the harsh conscience translates in an inability to confront others. Are you able to confront others? Saying no would just cause me too much guilt. Boundary problem. Remember our, our uh, one word sentence that we're going to learn in this class is no. No. No, yes. Compliance take on too many responsibilities and they set too few of boundaries because at their core, they are afraid. We do a lot of work on this in, re in recovery class because I don't know about you guys, but from the, uh, let's just talk about boys for just a minute. So from the time that you were a little boy, how many of you had any male figure tell you, ever tell you, are you scared, babe? Come here to daddy. Let me hold you. Does that, does that scare you? Let me hold your hand. I have to tell you a story that Brian told us this morning. Brian, is it okay if I share the story that you shared this morning? So when he was a little boy, they went to, um, to, this, to a ha uh, actual haunted house. And he said they headed in, and it was a, a pitch black room. And he was like, uh-uh, I ain't going in that black room. There ain't no way. I'm Uh-uh, I'm not doing it. And his dad reached back his hand, and he said, hold my hand and follow me, and I'll lead you through. 
And it was, he was able, because he heard his father's voice, because his father grabbed a hold of his hand, he was able to go through that haunted house. But many times we come from families that tell us, suck it up, be a man. What's wrong with you? Don't be a girl. What? I can't believe you're acting like that. And you know what is very acceptable? Anger. And it's also acceptable for girls. I'm not just, just saying it for just boys. But it's really inbred in boys from the time they're very, very, very little that they are not allowed to say that they are afraid. It's so much easier to say they're mad or to go off or pop off, pop off on somebody. So compliance, when they take on too many responsibilities and they don't set any boundaries in their lives, it is because at their core, they are scared. And they're scared of one of those things that we just went over. All right, number two. Does anyone have any comments on that one, on, on compliance? Any comments or I even any examples? Okay, all right. Number two, avoidance. Avoidant people say no to the good. A Bible study meeting at the Craig's home. They were having a, a Bible study for about six months long, and each gathering, everybody in the group would share except for the hosts of the group, the Craigs, and especially Rachel. Rachel and her husband had developed this group and its format, but caught up in their leadership role, Rachel never opened up about her struggles. She shied away from it. She shied away from the opportunity every time it would come up. And instead of sharing her personal struggles, she would draw the struggles out of the people. Well, what do you think happens in that dynamic? The people are growing. What happens to the host? What happens in that dynamic? The host is never growing. But one night... All the people in the meeting decided to wait on Sherry, and they shut their mouth. And she opened her mouth, and the first thing out of her mouth was invalidating her struggle. You know, what I go through, it's nothing compared to what you go through. You guys' pain is so much worse. So anyway, uh, how about you, Montana? Tell me about your immediately deferred off of herself. Who wants dessert? She avoided I do too. That sounds really good right now. She avoided the opportunity for others to love on her as they had been loved on by her. And this is an avoidant. This is what we call an avoidant. This lack of boundary is the inability to ask for help or to recognize one's own need and to let others in. Let's just be really honest for just a second. A lot of times we don't let others in because we've been hurt very deeply, right? So a lot of times this comes from roots. This comes from our story. You know, it's usually a, a lot of percentage of the time, it's never the circumstances that are tripping us up. It's the story. It's our story that we're living in and our parents' story that we came from and their parents' story that they came from. So avoidant is easy to do, man. I'll just not ever reveal anything about me to you, and I'll draw everything out of you. But do you know what that does to an avoidant? Do you know the, the lack? Do you know the barrenness on the inside of them when you never allow anyone to love you? That's a, that's, that's a terrible place to be in. So avoidance withdraw when they are in need. What are we supposed to do when we're in need? Reach out, reach out, reach out. It's hard for an avoidant to do. But why is this a boundary issue? Like, how does this make sense? Because we have to remember that boundaries are not walls, never. Boundary is not a wall that you put up to keep everybody out. Walls allow neither good nor bad to get in. Nothing touches you behind walls not even love. You know, people think, well, I have to build these impenetrable walls, not realizing that that doesn't even let God get in. I've got to, be, I've got to protect myself. I've got to armor my heart, and I won't let anybody in. But what do we do to ourselves when we do that? We completely lock love out of our lives. So God designed our personal boundaries to have gates freedom to enjoy safe relationships and avoid destructive ones. 
God even allows us the freedom to let us close him in or close him out. It says in Revelation 3.20, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. You guys realize that God will never violate your boundaries? If you put up walls to him, if you put up these impenetrable walls to God, he will not go past it. People blame God all the time when it's them that have these walls that keep him locked out. He will not cross our boundaries. He knows it would cause injury of uh, injury in our trust muscle. He knows what it will do, and so he will not co- cross it. It is whose responsibility to open it up to him, to open up our needs in repentance. It's our, we have to own this. It's our responsibility. God, I open my heart. I open my gate. I want you to come in. He's right there. He's right there knocking. We have to open the door and let him in. But avoidance have a rigidity to God-given needs. I will tell you guys, if you have come from religion, you were trained from the time that you were a little kid that needs are sin. Needs are not sin. It took me many, many years to understand that all of us have God-given needs. We need love. We need God's love. Every single one of us do. We need comfort. We need safety. We need belonging. That's why we do that in this church is because we have God-given legitimate needs. But if we live our entire lives shoving all of this out, all of these God-given legitimate needs, what are we left with? Very, very shallow lives, very shallow relationships in our lives. So they avoidance experience their problems and legitimate needs as something bad. So when they need to feel safety, they think they're bad. What's wrong with me? I'm bad. I, can't, I shouldn't feel this way. I'm an adult. Why, why do I need to feel safety? Because it's a legitimate need. When they, when they experience, oh, I need love so bad, an avoidant will push away, push away because there's something bad, inherently bad about needing love. No, there's not. It's God-given legitimate needs. But they experience them as bad, destructive, or shameful. So what happens when we experience love as shameful? We hide from it. Because any time we're in shame, shame says hide. Shame says, armor up, put a, put a wall over that heart and don't let anybody in. Don't, don't you go out. Don't do that. That's what shame does. Some people are both compliant and avoidant, all at the same time. And a lot of us were trained very well in this from the time we were little. When someone needs me for four hours, yes, yes. I'll I'll come give you my time. Yes, there's no way I can say no. But when I need someone for 10 minutes, I'm not going to ask. There's no way I can put people out. I I just won't ask. That's what that looks like. A compliant avoidant. Compliant avoidants suffer from reversed boundaries. So they have no boundaries where they need them, and they have boundaries where they shouldn't have them. Anybody relate to this? I don't want to put anybody out, but I will go and I'll slave and I'll leave my family and I'll, and I'll go 24-7 and I'll do all these things, but never ask for a single need to be met inside of you. And again, maybe we were trained this way from the time we were really little. Maybe this is the only language that we know. There's no way I can say no to them. Is that really Christian? Number three, controllers. Controllers do not respect other people's boundaries. He starts off with this story. What do you mean you're quitting? You can't leave now. This is Steve, the boss. Steve was a controller, and he did not respect any boundaries. And he would sit, insist that his employee, Frank, spent unpaid hours at the office. He even insisted on Frank changing his vacation plans. So it didn't even, uh, not only did it affect him um, on when he needed him to stay longer, but even on a vacation day. No, you need to change your plans. Talk about 
controlling big time. The final straw came, though, when Steve began calling and texting Frank at home every single day during dinner time. He finally had enough. He's like, this, this has gotten to be too much. Now, you realize that if Frank was a compliant, what would a compliant do? Okay, I'll be right there. Uh, hello? Yeah, I'm at dinner. That's okay. I'll, I'll miss dinner with my family. What do you need? What else would a compliant do? Yes, I, I'll miss my vacation. That's okay. What, what would an avoidant do? Huh? I'm definitely not going to tell him, hey, it's dinner time. I'm just going to I'm just going to avoid telling him my legitimate needs. Hey, I need some vacation time. Is an avoidance not going to do that, right? Okay, so Frank, uh, Steve had finally had enough. Several times Frank tried to talk to Steve about his his boundary violations, but Steve didn't get why there was a problem. When you are a controller, you don't understand. Why do you have a problem? Because they don't see boundaries. A controller doesn't see any boundaries. He did not see how he had burned Frank completely out. After all, Steve needed Frank. And you guys, this can also apply to codependents. Because if you're codependent and if you're pulling the strings, if you're the controller in a codependent, well, you know what? I need you. I need you. But Jason, I can't do this without you. I need you. Well, you can't go be separate from me on that because I need you. It's all about my needs. I need, I need, I need. That's what controllers do. Frank made him look successful. So at the end of the day, who was it really about? It was about Steve. All about Steve. Make me look good. It's all about me. I don't care about you. I don't care about your home life. I don't care about your vacation life. I don't care when you eat dinner. I don't care anything about you. It's all about me, and you need to make me look good. So Frank made uh, Steve look successful, and it was easy to get him to work harder. Um, You guys have probably all heard of this statement. If you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. (laughs) You're probably a busy person. (laughs) Oh, give it to a busy person because usually busy people can't say no. So to Steve, what does no mean? No means challenge on. Challenge accepted. Let's do this thing. I will change your mind. At the end of the day, I will convince you why it's a good idea for you to take on my responsibility. That's what controllers do. Controllers cannot respect other people's limits. They resist taking responsibility for their own lives. So they need to control others. Now, a lot of times, you guys, we were trained from the time that we were little to not that we didn't. We had no control over our lives, right? Never in a million years do you think that that small child that has absolutely no control over their life will raise up and control other people. They have to. They think that's the only way they can get along. They need you. Do this for me. Do my responsibilities for me. I need you. I'm unable. And maybe they have heard that message their whole life, and it's crippled them. I know that many, 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 many times I would jump in and save the day for my son Josiah many times. And later in life, he would tell me that what that translated to him, that it was that he was unable when in my mind, it was just like, I want to be a good mom. I want to, I want to save the day. I want to put my, my cape on, and I want to save the day. And you know what? We didn't do that with Montana and Austin, and they're both responsible adults. They both take care of their own responsibilities, whereas we crippled Josiah. And he raised up, and he got into a relationship, and he became a controller. What did you say? <laughs> I did what? <laughs> I ruined it. I said that, didn't I? Oh, sorry. I ruined him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> own me. I'm, I'm owning me. I promise. Controllers cannot respect other people's limits. They honestly, they, they say, game on. The, let's do this thing. They resist taking responsibility for their own lives, and so they need to control other people's lives. Relationships are wrecked when we treat them like We are a salesman. Wrecked. No means maybe, and maybe means yes to a controller. No means maybe, and maybe means yes. Controllers, they're perceived as bullies, manipulative, and aggressive. 
The primary problem of individuals who can't hear no, different from being able to say no, re realize that controllers, they can say no all day long. They cannot hear. Don't you dare tell me no. They cannot hear no. Is that they tend to project responsibility for their lives on to others. You're responsible for my behavior. You're responsible for making me mad. You're responsible for this. And you're responsible. Isn't that an easy way to live, making everybody else responsible? It's not an easy way to live. It's awful. It's an awful way to live. We have to own our own lives. Nobody is responsible for our, own, for our lives. We are responsible. So they project their lives onto others, uh, their responsibility for their lives onto others. They use various means of control to motivate others to carry the load intended by God. That is their load alone. So controllers, they look for someone to carry their individual responsibilities in addition to their crisis and heavy burdens. You need to carry my individual responsibilities. You need to, um, you need to, what, what are some of your guys' responsibilities? Can you guys think of any? Work. You need, okay. Let's, let's talk about housework. You need to do all the housework. I'm not taking any responsibility. You need to do all that. You need to take on what, what I can't take on my, my phone. You need to, you need to fix my phone. You need to uh, pay the bills. You need to, you need to do it all on top of that. Every time I am in crisis or have heavy burdens, you're responsible to make me happy. That's a controller. Absolutely miserable. But remember, oftentimes where this comes from is that from a small child, what you internalized from, and, and you guys were not throwing shade on our parents because our parents had it too. It's passed down. But as a small child, we internalized, I am not able to be responsible for me. I am not able to make good decisions for my life. I am not, I am not qualified. And so we never grew up or, or built that muscle. So it's, you're qualified tell you guys, I'm married to a strong man. He's very, very, very qualified. And he can take on a billion and one things. And at the beginning of our marriage, I was a codependent. By the way, I'm a recovering codependent. Always will be. But I have had to learn my life is not his responsibility, even though he can carry it really well. Because when I start expecting him to carry it, I get into control mode. And then I get outside of the plan of God. It's a boundary problem. Maybe from the effect of having a controller. It can also it can also come from trauma as we've gotten older. Anything that we experience and internalize that's out of our control that we don't take to God, then we think that we have to control it. We think that we have to put our hand on it and we control it. So the, I, I know there's probably a million different reasons why we become controllers. Um, a lot of it comes from our upbringing, but not all of it. Like you, that, That's a very, very good point. So had Steve carried the weight of his own job, don't you think for a second that Frank would have been glad to pitch in extra help? He would have been. Absolutely would have been. Every now and then. Not all the time, but every now and then. But the pressure for covering for Steve's irresponsibility made a talented professional look elsewhere for work. So at the end of the day, what does a controller do to the people that they control? Yep, yep, they push them away. All right, so controllers come in two types. This is found on page 60, uh, 56 and 57. Controllers come in two types. Number one type is an aggressive controller. Do uh, con con Aggressive controllers do not listen to others' boundaries. They run over people's fences like a tank. Sometimes they are verbally abusive. Sometimes they are physically abusive. But most of the time, they are completely unaware that others have any boundaries whatsoever. Unaware of it. Don't even realize that's a boundary in someone else. They act as though they live in a world of yeses. How many of you came from a world of yeses? 
never a no. They try to make a world fit their ideas of the way that life should be. Not the way life is, but the way life should be. They neglect their responsibility to accept others as they are. It's funny, Jason and I were just talking about Peter last night, and I told him I feel like I'm, uh, I'm a Peter in so many ways. It's like slashing off the ear of the, the soldier. But think about Peter in the Bible. He's an example of an aggressive controller. So Jesus is telling the disciples about his upcoming suffering, about his, his death, about the resurrection. And what does Peter do? He takes Jesus aside and he rebukes Jesus. And it was out, you guys realized that it was out of a good heart. Like, no, you're not going to suffer, man. You're not going to die. You stop saying that kind of stuff. He rebuked him. What did Jesus tell Peter? <sighs> oh, the Lord told me that this week. Get behind me, Satan. This is the reality of what an abuser, a controlling abuser looks like. You guys, in our, in our, in our minds, we don't paint it this way, do we? We think we're doing something good. We're not. So this was found in Mark 8.33. Peter did not want to accept the Lord's boundaries. I don't even, yeah, he just completely skipped over God's boundaries. And because of it, Jesus immediately confronted Peter's violation of his boundaries. Number two, manipulative controllers. Oh, they try to persuade people out of their boundaries. So they recognize you have a boundary, but let me just talk you out of it. It'll be good. They want to talk you into a yes because they cannot accept your no. They want their way, and they seduce others into carrying their burdens, and they do it by sending guilt messages. What are some examples of guilt messages? What makes you feel guilty? Well, I thought you were, were a man. Well, I thought you could carry that. Well, I thought, well, I thought, well, I thought. Instead of just accepting their no, I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to get a, a yes out of them. I thought you cared about me. I thought you loved me. I thought we were in this together. These are guilt messages. Like Jacob deceived Esau into giving up his birthright. Numerous times he used his cleverness. He used this manipulation to avoid his brother's boundaries. It wasn't until he was confronted by God in human form with his dishonesty that he took responsibility and he repented and he learned to accept other people's limits. In uh, Genesis 25 all the way through 27 is this story. It talks about how God wrestled with him all night long. And after wrestling him, with him all night long, what was he left with? See what I mean by how we can relate to all of this? You guys, any of you in here have a limp like I have that you wrestled with God all night long when God was trying to tell you something and trying to tell you something and trying to tell you something? You're like, God, why can't I hear you? And you just keep wrestling and wrestling and wrestling. Let me tell you, God always wins. Always. And it's out of his love. It's out of his love that he does this, out of his love that he corrects us and gets, gets on top of it. But it's only when the manipulative, man, manipulative controller is confronted with their dishonesty can they take responsibility for it. And they, can they repent from it? And can they turn away? And can they accept other people's limits? It's only when they are confronted Manipulators deny their desires to control others. They are like the adulterous woman in the Proverbs 30, verse 20. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. I've done nothing wrong. What's wrong with you? I've, I've done nothing. Believe it or not, compliance and avoidance can also be controllers. Uh-oh. Let's take it back to our first two. Take it back to our compliance and take it back to our avoidance. They can also be controllers. This is why I told you guys how I can relate to all of these. But they tend to be more manipulative than aggressors. So aggressors will just come right out of the gate. Aggressors will, you'll know right away how an aggressor feels. They're on top of you. And then there's those sly manipulators manipulative ones, the avoidant ones that just slip in a message here and slip in a message there to get their will, to get their way, or the avoidant ones, they, they tend to be more manipulative. So an example, 
need, someone needs some emotional support, and so they do a favor for a friend. How nice, right? Do a favor for a friend, but they're manipulative. So they do the favor for the friend in hopes that this act of love will bring about the other reciprocating, and they'll receive love back. Is that love? What does love do? <laughs> Ramey says, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> well, you're on the front row. <laughs> this is not real love because real love does not seek a return investment. You will know right away if you genuinely have real love in your heart by if you're wanting to get a return investment. You'll, you'll real quickly know. And if you're wanting to get a return investment, and you don't curb it and learn boundaries, we become controllers. We become manipulative controllers. So caring for someone because you want them to care back is an indirect means of controlling them. It's still control. It's just an indirect. So there's the straight-on ones, and then there's the indirect ones. A price tag is always attached for everything that this controller, this manipulative controller, whether they're an avoidant or, or a, what's the other one? An avoidant or a compliant, whether they are, there's always a price tag attached. You will pay me back somehow. I'll get what I need out of you somehow. So what is the boundary issue here? At this point, you might say, how can controllers be called injured? To me, it sounds like controllers are injuring, right? They damage others, but they also have boundary problems because controllers are undisciplined people. They do not have the will to curb their appetites or their desires. They hate the word no. They hate delayed gratification. They want relationships that are like microwave relationships now. They don't want anything taking time. And you guys, I so understand this. How many of you like to, to take time in, in developing relationships? Anybody? You like the, the process that it entails and the, and, the, and the rolling out the unconditional love for months or years? Or how many of you enjoy that? It's hard. We want now. We want you to reciprocate now. And when people don't reciprocate to us right now, if we're manipulative controllers and we don't deal with it, we'll just go to the next relationship. Heck with that relationship. That was way too hard. I'm just going to go to the next one that is easy. Never realizing that the boundary problem is inside of us because we're undisciplined people. So it appears that they are getting what they want, but... They are slaves to their own appetites. So it might look to everybody else like they're getting what they want, but they are slaves to their own appetites. Uh, they need to learn to listen to other people's boundaries to help them observe their own. You guys, let me just be really, really, really frank in case you don't know this. You have to develop a listening ear. It doesn't often come really easy especially if, if you are one of these, especially if you have boundary problems in any, in any areas. It's really hard to truly listen. Oftentimes, we'll listen, but we listen from our own wounds. We listen from our own scripts. We listen from, we don't truly listen to the heart of another person. Or we try to listen, but they speak a different language than we do. So instead of asking really good questions, oh, forget that. That's way too hard. So I'll just try to control them and get my way. So we have to learn to listen. Controllers, though, they rely on bullying or indirectness. I'll either bully you or I'll just be indirect and make you feel so bad that you wish you just complied with whatever I said. They cannot function on their own in the world. They cannot own their own world. The only remedy is to let controllers experience the consequences of their irresponsibility. Oh, consequences are hard, aren't they? <laughs> They're tough. They're so, so tough. Finally, controllers are isolated. You see a problem with that? Anytime we live isolated, there's a problem. People only stay with them out of fear, out of guilt, or out of dependency. That's the only reason people stay with them. Control, controllers rarely feel loved. 
They know the only reason that anyone stays with them is because they pull the strings. If they stop threatening or manipulating, they would be abandoned. 1 John 4, 8 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Number four, non-responsives. Not hearing the needs of others. This is on page 59 if you guys are following along in your book. So Mike was a really good provider. He was an active Christian, and he was a competent father. Yet the relationship allowed no room for Brenda's hurts or her needs. Brenda waited for the kids to be asleep to have a conversation with Mike. And as she was communicating her fears about child rearing and, and her fears about her inadequacy at work, she was, just, she was just laying her heart out there to her husband, Mike, when Mike turned around and he said this. If you don't like the way that you feel, why don't you change your feelings? Life's tough, so just handle it, Brenda. <sighs> you know, anger would be the, the, the go-to mode right here, right? We, so we think. But what is the base of what she felt right here? She was hurt. That, that's painful when someone... Someone that you love won't jump in the boat with you and just, and just row with you for a minute. When, when someone you love invalidates you and says, it, it, just suck it up, what's wrong with you? You know, when someone won't crawl with you and, and hold you and say, oh, that, that must have been really hard. Not owning your problems, but just crawling in with you and getting beside you and hugging you. Brenda was devastated, and she felt like Mike had no understanding whatsoever of her struggle, nor did he want to. He completely did not care what she was going through. So how is this a boundary problem? Isn't it just basic ins insensitivity? It definitely is insensitivity, for sure. Partially, yes. While we should not take on other people's responsibilities, their feelings, their attitudes, and their behaviors, we do have a certain responsibility to each other. To each other. Not for each other. Does everybody get that? I'm not responsible for you. I'm responsible to you, to care, to validate you. Mike has the responsibility to connect with his wife. As a parenting partner, as a loving husband, connecting emotionally is part of loving her as himself. Did everybody get that? Connecting emotionally with her is a part of loving her as loving himself. He isn't responsible for her emotional well-being, but he is responsible to her as she is going through her emotions. Does that make sense to everybody? Not for, to. I know, it's a switch of paradigm, isn't it? I told you, it's kind of like learning a different language. He wasn't responsible for her emotions. He was responsible to his wife to be there emotionally to connect with her. Am I saying that okay? Is everybody getting that? Okay. All right. This is termed non-responsive because of their lack of attention to the responsibility of love. They exhibit the opposite of the pattern in Proverbs 3, 27. It says, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is your, in your power to do it. That in your power right there, it means within your resources and your availability. Don't withhold good. What are responsible to care? We are responsible to care about and help within certain limits. Others whom God places in our lives. To refuse to do it when we have the resources can definitely be a boundary conflict. So non-responsives, they fall into two distinct groups. Number one, those who are, have a critical spirit toward others. So they, they, they don't, they have a, if you have a need, they're critical towards you. If you need love, they're critical toward love. If you need safety, they're critical toward safety. It's, and it, what it is, is it's a projection of their own hatred of their needs onto others. 
So they have for so long had this hatred. I'm bad. What's wrong with me? I'm going to shove my knees down. I'm not going to ask for anything. They have such a hatred toward their own needs, and they have disowned their own needs, even though they're still inside of them. But what do we do when we're disowning and not owning? We're projecting. So I'm going to project onto you. And how I project onto you is in a critical spirit. What's wrong with you? Suck it up. I, why are you so upset? If you're upset, get happy. You see what that does? It's a critical spirit. So Matthew 7, 1 says, do not judge or you will too be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. This is what happens with projectors. We project onto others, not understanding that we, have, we got to look on the inside of us, which is why this next verse is so good. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the big giant plank that is in your own eye? You see, can you understand why? If you have a plank in your eye this big, can you understand what you see all the time in others? How important is it that we deal with our stuff? How important is it that we own our stuff? So if you have, have been raised and nurtured and, and taught your whole entire life to take all of your legitimate God-given needs and to shove them down inside of you, to sear your conscience and to avoid, uh, avoid everything that's good, to, to, to not be able to make a good decision, if you have uh, been a controller or been taught from the time that you're a little kid that, that, you, um, that you can't do anything and so you raise up and try to control everything, understand where this is coming from. It's coming from that plank that is inside of us that you've never dealt with. So what you're seeing in other people is a projection of what's on the inside of you. I know that's a hard pill to swallow, guys. I know. It's a hard pill for me to swallow. We don't see other people as they are. We see other people as we are. We've got to deal with our stuff. We've got to learn these boundary problems and begin to develop really good boundaries. So they hate being incomplete in themselves, and as a result, they ignore the needs of others. Well, I'm not getting my needs met, so you dang sure ain't getting your needs met. And anyways, these needs are bad inside of me. Wrong. Okay, number two. Those who are so absorbed in their own desires and needs that they exclude others. This is a, indeed a form of narcissism. Um, Philippians 2, 4 says, don't look out for only your own interest, but take an interest in others also. And then there are the controllers and non-responsives. Controllers and non-responsives. They have a hard time looking past themselves. They see others as responsible for their struggles, and they're on the lookout for someone to take care of them. They look for someone. Who do they look for? I'll just look for someone without boundaries. I'll just look for someone to take on my responsibilities in my relationships and I don't want them to complain about it. I just want them to get on board and to do my responsibilities. So he tells a joke in here that I thought was too cute. He says, what happens when a rescuing, enabling person meets a controlling, insensitive person? They get married. Ooh, okay, so, comp <laughs> so let's look at this little chart. That, that was this. Did you guys all see this little chart in here? This is the diagram on page 61. Did everybody look at that as you read through your chapter? Okay, does it make more sense now that we've gone through the chapter? So the compliant, they cannot say no. They feel guilty and or controlled by others to set any boundaries. They cannot set boundaries. The non-responsive can't say yes. They set boundaries against the responsibility to love. And then the controllers cannot hear. So they aggressively or manipulatively violate boundaries in others, and the avoidance can't hear, so they set boundaries against receiving care of others. I was hoping that it would all make sense once, once we got to, to that point. So then the last one that he covers is functional and relational boundary issues. So a final boundary problem involves the distinction between functional and relational boundaries. So functional boundaries are a person's ability to complete a task, a project, or a job. It has to do with performance. 
discipline, initiative, and planning. And a relational boundary is the ability to speak truth to others with whom we are in relationship. So functional boundaries refer to our Martha parts. We're going to talk for just a second about Martha and Mary in the Bible. Does everyone remember the story about Martha and Mary? So Jesus was coming to town, and uh, Martha asked him to come over to her house. And since Jesus was coming to her house, what was she going to do? She was going to get it ready. And she was going to have the best meal, and she was going to clean the house. And she was, she was busy, 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 busy. She was able to take on a lot of tasks, and she was good at it. And what was Mary? Mary was relational. And Jesus came in, and Mary sat at Jesus' feet. And in this, in this particular story, Jesus said that Mary chose the better thing because she chose Jesus. But that's the difference in relational and functional, okay? Everybody get that? So Martha complained, Mary sat. Um, so it's, it, so Martha, I, in this story, Martha wasn't bad. It was just the wrong thing at the wrong time. What should Martha have been doing? Right. So in other words, the Bible isn't saying you need to go be lazy and you need to go sit at Jesus' feet and do nothing. You know, sure, I remember when when there was this big movement that everybody needed to quit their jobs because there was no point in having jobs and everybody just needed to be Jesus freaks and go all over the country. And that's not what this is saying. We need to be responsible. We need to hold down jobs. We need to have tasks. We need to, all those things. But consider the timing. If Jesus is right there, you know, Pastor David has talked about how in the morning time he has set a boundary on his, his um, prayer time. And during that prayer time, he turns his phone off. He doesn't answer his phone. What would it be if every morning he came in to pray and he's answering texts the whole entire time? Right. It would be the wrong time. It would, it, it's not that there's anything wrong with him answering his text, but he set that time aside for Jesus. So does that make sense to everybody? The relational? Okay, good. So many people have good functional boundaries, but poor relational ones. They can perform tasks at high levels of competence, but they cannot tell a friend that they don't like their chronic lateness. The reverse can also be true. Someone can be a perfectly honest, be perfectly honest with a friend, but not be able to get up for work in the morning. So why do some people seem like it comes so natural to have boundaries while others have no boundaries at all? Again, a lot of it has to do with our upbringing. There is, there is other things along the way. We can have traumas in our life that creates areas of boundaries. I know that it's so funny because after our son, our oldest son, Josiah, he died at the age of 25. And after he died, Jason and I flipped roles, Whew, completely flipped roles. Jason wanted our adult children to live with us forever after Josiah died. And I wanted our adult children, okay, I am never going to spoil another child like I did my son. I'm going to push them out of the nest like a good mama does and go fly. We re it totally reversed, didn't we? Like completely. Re so for different reasons, do we go through these problems, these boundary problems? It can be traumas. It can be life experiences. It can be our upbringing. It can be, if it is our upbringing, I just want to tell you, it's going to take you practice and time. Okay? If you have one of these boundary problems, or if you have four of them, if it has been inbred in you from the time that you were a little girl or a little boy, it's going to take time. But don't you worry. This is God's specialty. God will teach us how to have good, healthy boundaries. And it's really good that we have a church where we can make mistakes in, where we can fall flat on our face and people will forgive us when we have our boundary issues. It's so good that we have a culture here that, that is safe, that we can all learn this. And so I don't, don't walk out of here discouraged if you're like, oh my gosh, I have all these problems. Please don't walk out discouraged. Walk out and understand that you're in a good place, that God is going to heal you up, that maybe you didn't know before now, but now you do. Okay, so we have looked at the different categories of boundaries. Next week is my personal favorite chapter. We're going to learn about how to develop the boundaries. How many of you would like to develop boundaries? Absolutely. It's, it's such a good thing, such a good thing to learn. So we're at 730. Does anyone have any questions or comments or stories or anything? Go ahead, Ash. Gotcha.
That's awesome. That's great. I love it. That's good. That's good. So yours came from injury then. You, you said the word trust. It lets you trust people. So did yours come from injury? Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that's good. That's a good thought. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, we're going to learn how to how to get good boundaries. Don't you worry. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yes, he will. <laughs> He's like, I, I didn't sign up for that day. <laughs> Anybody else? Compliant and avoidant. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And maybe it's different dynamics in each relationship, too. Don't know. Yeah. Yep. True. I agree. Absolutely agree. Anybody else? Mm-hmm. 